Well, hey everybody, this is Robert and welcome to today's show. And today I want to look at uh, President Woodrow Wilson. And I entitled this Beyond Racism, His Failures Had the Most Dire Consequences of Any U.S. President. Right? That's a major thing to say. But I'm going to try to prove that to you today. Now, Wilson became topic of the news lately when uh, the, the place that he was president um, for a number of years, Princeton University, um, came out and made some moves uh, concerning a building or buildings, a school that's named after him. Uh, the current president is Christopher L. Eisgruber. And there was a posting um, on Saturday said President Eisgruber's message to the community on the removal of the Woodrow Wilson name from the public policy school in Wilson College. It says the Board of Trustees concludes that Wilson's racist views and policies make him an inappropriate namesake for the School of Public and International Affairs and Residential College. And these are some of the excerpts out of uh, Eisgruber's letter to the school on June 27th. And it says, Wilson's racism was significant and consequential, even by the standards of his own time. Wilson's segregationist policies make him an especially inappropriate namesake for a public policy school. And my last excerpt is, Princeton honored Wilson not because of but without regard to, or perhaps even in ignorance of, his racism. And if you go to the Princeton University website, you, you can go through and see they have news story after news story talking about uh, Woodrow Wilson and um, racism and uh, related topics now, um, racial justice and all that kind of stuff. So... I encourage you to check out what's going on at Princeton because it's very interesting. And it's interesting in this way, too. Because back in 2015, uh, I get this from a Vox article. And it says, a group of Princeton students stormed the offices of President Christopher Eisgruber to demand that Woodrow Wilson's name be removed from all programs and buildings at the university. That's a big ask. Princeton has an entire school, the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, named after Wilson, who served as university president from 1902 to 1910, before his time in the White House. He also has the Wilson College, is a residential college for undergrads. So far, the university is standing firm, insisting that in an AP uh, article, Quote, it is important to weigh Wilson's racism and how bad it was with the contributions he made to the nation. Very interesting. And that's going to be very interesting um, as we continue on with this uh, YouTube video. And on the video, you can see that I put up a, a tweet from November 19th, 2015, from our friend Joe Scarborough at Morning Joe on MSNBC. And he tweeted out in 2015, Insanity breaks out at Princeton. Now Woodrow Wilson is a racist pig. Period. Enough. Period. Stand firm, President Eisgruber. All right. So how things have changed in a matter of five years. Now, Wilson was a racist, and, and that's pretty clear cut. He saw, oversaw the resegregation of multiple agencies of the federal government, which had been surprisingly integrated as a result of Reconstruction decades earlier. At an April 11, 1913 cabinet meeting, Postmaster General Albert Burleson argued for segregating the railway mail service. He took exception to the fact that workers shared glasses, towels, and washrooms. Wilson offered no objection to Burleson's plan for segregation. 
Now, upon taking office, Wilson himself fired 15 out of 17 black supervisors in the federal service and replaced them with white people. After the Treasury and Post Office began segregating, many black workers were let go. The head of the IRS in Georgia fired all of his black employees, saying, quote, There are no government positions for Negroes in the South. A Negro's place is in the cornfield. Close quote. So, yeah, some bad stuff, right? He was also a vocal defender of the Ku Klux Klan. And, in fact, in one of his books, there's a quote from one of his books that's actually in the movie from, I think it's 1915. It's called Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith. And uh, it in this movie basically... Um, looks at the KKK as saviors of the South. And this was the quote for one of, from one of Wilson's books, which was featured in the movie. It says, quote, The white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country. Close quote, Woodrow Wilson. And Wilson even uh, gave his approval for this movie, The Birth of the Nation, by screening it at the White House and reportedly telling Griffith that it could teach history with lightning. Uh, Wilson was also a very strong supporter of Jim Crow. Okay, so it's very clear, and, and I could have went on a lot more about that particular topic, but you get the point, right? Not a good guy. But he's not a good guy in a lot of ways. And we're going to look at some of his failures of commission that probably had the most dire consequences of any U.S. president. More than any president, Woodrow Wilson has caused arguably the most damage of any president. A Woodrow Wilson, quote, screwed up the entire 20th century and beyond. Now, Wilson ran for re-election by hailing himself as a man who kept the United States out of the war back in uh, 19, um, the 19-teens. But immediately upon entering his second term, he sought to get the country into war by manipulating neutrality policy. World War I was probably history's worst catastrophe and U.S. President Woodrow Wilson was substantially responsible for the unintended consequences of the war that played out in Germany and Russia, contributing to the rise of totalitarian regimes and another world war. If the U.S. had stayed out of the war, it seems likely there would have been some kind of negotiated settlement. Instead, what did we get? Lenin, Stalin, Hitler monsters, all born of the president's policies. And let me go ahead and read something to you. The United States had little strategic stake in the outcome of the outgoing war or the ongoing war in Europe. U.S. territory was not threatened by an attack from Germany or the weak empires of the Austro-Hungarians or the Ottomans. Those armies were tied down on European continent by allied armies on the Eastern Russian and Western England and France fronts. Colonel Edward House, Wilson's closest advisor, thought that if Germany gained control over Europe, it could challenge Britain and its benevolent command of the seas, which he believed was responsible for the security of the United States that we enjoyed. The problem with this line of reasoning was that up until the late 1800s, British power on land and at sea had not been benevolent to the United States and sometimes had posed a security threat. Thus, U.S. security depended more on its vast distance from Europe than on any unchallenged British fleet. Instead of getting involved in World War I, the United States could have further built up its fleet to promote security. At any rate, this fear is more applicable to Nazi Germany's rapid conquest in World War II, then to the stalemated battlefield that Wilson saw in April 1917 when he asked for a declaration of war. Even if Germany had won World War I, 
It would have been by a 15-round decision rather than by a knockout. Both sides would have been exhausted from more than four years of unprecedented carnage. The likely negotiated settlement would have shifted borders only somewhat in the victors' favor, as they had in so many other European wars that the U.S. had avoided. In sum, as British historian Niall Ferguson has pointed out, German domination of Central Europe eventually occurred anyway, as German preeminence in the modern-day European Union shows. But it would have occurred at a far lower cost if it had been allowed to begin in 1918. In fact, as early as December 1916, the Germans desired peace talks while wanting to keep the land they occupied in Belgium and France. But because Britain and France expected the U.S. entry into the war was likely and would turn the tide in their favor, they rejected the settlement. If the United States had stayed out, the French and the British would have been forced to take the settlement and end the war. So very important look back at uh, that time for World War uh, One. Now, speaking of Lenin, Stalin, and Hitler, I'll go on to continue reading another few paragraphs. Illustrating the often severe, unpredictable, and unintended consequences of war, German resentment over the unjust war guilt clause, and other humiliations, as well as an economic plan caused by the war and exorbitant reparations, led to the rise of Adolf Hitler and the even more cataclysmic World War II. In the interwar years, the large reparations gave the Germans reason to inflate their currency to pay their debts in devalued marks, thus creating a hyperinflation that was worse than in other nations. Also, the British hunger blockade, which was starving the German population, continued even after the fighting had long stopped. The continuing blockade designed to increase British leverage during the peace negotiations was clearly a war crime. In addition, Wilson pushed for the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II, removing a huge obstacle in Hitler's path to power. Also, Hitler's popularity fed off German nationalism, uh, national humiliation, and economic problems. Wilson also played a role in triggering the Russian Revolution and then meddled into the ensuing Russian Civil War. That is, he inadvertently helped the communists take power initially in Russia and then made them hate the United States, thus paving the way for a Cold War that would last for decades. Wilson had nothing to do with the first uprising in the Russian Revolution, which led to the Tsar's abdication on March 15, 1917, and the installation of a provisional government, eventually headed by Alexander Kerensky. After the U.S. entered World War I, however, Wilson offered the provisional government $325 $325 million, which would be about $4 billion in today's dollars, in credits to remain in the war, adding to the extensive pressure on Kerensky's regime to continue to support the Allied cause. With U.S. involvement, the provisional government had hoped that Germany actually could be defeated. The outcome was the so-called Grand Offensive against the Germans. About 400,000 Russians died, bringing the Russian wartime death total to 1.7 million, and hundreds of thousands were uh, more deserted. The disastrous offensive motivated most of the Russian army to sympathize with the Bolsheviks, the only Russian party that wanted Russia to immediately withdraw from the hugely unpopular war. After an ensuing summer crisis, the Russian army collapsed, and the provisional government couldn't have been defeated even if the military had desired to do so. The Bolsheviks, benefiting from this radicalization of the population, came to power in the fall of 1917. Lenin noted, our revelation, excuse me, our revolution was born of the war. According to Jim Powell, if the Allies had not pressured the provisional government into staying in the war, and Wilson had not bribed them to do so, that government might not have survived and Lenin would have been a forgotten man. So, yeah. Important stuff. Uh, The unintended consequences of some of these moves and where things go. And we can see that this could have 
literally been an impetus to the rise of these butchers like Lenin, Stalin, and Hitler. Okay. And speaking of Jim Powell, uh, he wrote uh, at Cato back in 2014. He says, Thanks to Wilson's misguided policies, the Bolshevik coup led to seven decades of Soviet communism. Historian R.J. Rummel estimated that almost 62 million people were killed by the Soviet government. He estimated that all 20th century communist regimes killed between 110 million and 260 million people. Now, nothing Wilson could have, nothing Wilson did could compensate for the colossal blunder of entering World War I. He claimed his League of Nations would help prevent future wars, but charter members of the League of Nations were most of the winners of the war and their friends. Countries that hadn't been fighting each other, they vowed to continue not fighting each other. Member nations agreed to join in defending any of them that might be attacked, which meant that the League was another alliance. An attack on one member nation would lead to a wider war. The World War I losers weren't members. And of course, as we know, this did lead uh, a number of years later to um, the UN. Uh, Woodrow Wilson is actually been called by, of all people, the interventionist himself, Max Boot, uh, the most interventionist president in U.S. history. And uh, he, he intervened in a lot of countries south of our border. And let, let me go, let's talk about that a little bit. Wilson's most catastrophic intervention was World War I, but it was not his only one. In fact, Max Boot, neocon extraordinaire, loves intervention, notes that Wilson was the most interventionist president in U.S. history. The American mainland was re had rarely been attacked with ground forces. Only in the Madison administration during the War of 1812 and in the Wilson administration did this occur. In both cases, because the U.S. first started hostilities with an adverse adversary who later attacked the American homeland. Wilson's snafu was on a far smaller scale than Madison's, but it was a blunder nonetheless. Wilson turned a minor incident into a U.S. military intervention that ultimately caused Mexican guerrillas to attack a U.S. town near the Mexican border, which in turn spurred a U.S. invasion of Mexico. In 1914, eight U.S. sailors went ashore in Mexico to get gasoline. A Mexican colonel ordered their arrest. He soon realized the political implications and released them. A Mexican general then arrested the colonel and apologized to the U.S. ship's commanding officer. Unbelievably, the U.S. officer demanded a formal apology, assurance that the colonel would be punished, and a 21-gun salute to the U.S. naval vessel. That matter was escalated to the top, both in the U.S. and the Mexican governments. Um, anyway, a as you can imagine, we ended up sending U.S. troops into Mexico, and, um, and it nearly caused a war with our neighbors to the south. Now, the Wilson's interventionism in Mexico wasn't his only in Latin America. In addition to invading Mexico in 1914 and 1916, Wilson ordered U.S. forces to invade Nicaragua in 1914, Haiti in 1915, the Dominican Republic in 1916, Cuba in 1917, Panama in 1918, and Mexico nine other times. In Nicaragua, the U.S. military chose the country's president and extorted privileges to build an Atlantic to Pacific Canal. The occupation of Haiti lasted 19 years and was motivated by pressure from a U.S. bank killed thousands of Haitians, and made the country less democratic. The occupation of the Dominican Republic lasted eight years and created a local centralized military force that future dictators would use to suppress their own people. So, again, more unintended, unintended consequences from Wilson's actions that not only affected the United States in a detrimental way, but our neighbors and the people across the world.
And along with Wilson came a lot of increased power, expanded uh, government, and eroded civil liberties. Now, after World War I, the U.S. economy was never the same. Many conservatives blame FDR for creating a permanent big government in the U.S., and he certainly did contribute to it. But Wilson laid the groundwork by intervening in the economy during World War I on an unprecedented scale. For example, Wilson appointed William Gibbs McAdoo to run the railroads, Bernard Baruch to supervise industrial production, and Herbert Hoover to manage food production. The National Defense Acts of 1916 and 1917 gave Wilson the power to procure military armaments by any means needed, And the Lever Food and Fuel Control Act of 1917 allowed Wilson to fix prices, commandeer needed materials for the war, seize and operate industrial plants, and regulate production, mining and transportation, and storage of items needed for the war. Yeah, a lot of that sounds awful lot like Venezuela in in a way, right? Uh, The Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917 authorized Wilson to declare a state of national emergency and control transactions in which any foreign nation had an interest. The blanket law covered censoring all communications with foreign nations, property seizures, suspension of the gold standard, and even conscription. The Overman Act allowed Wilson to reorganize the responsibilities of the executive agencies without congressional approval, which bestowed on Wilson near dictatorial powers. Under the act, Wilson unilaterally created new agencies not related to the military or combat, for example, the FDA and the Fuel Administration, which rationed food and fuel, respectively. Wilson also created the Railroad Administration, which seized railroads and operated them until 1920, well after the war was over. Now, speaking of the, some of the civil liberties, um, The Congress passed the Selective Service Act of 1917, which authorized Wilson to draft men against their will to fight in a distant war, that is, to fight for freedom by losing their own liberty. Um, The Sedition Act of 1918 uh, were probably the most serious attacks on civil liberties of Americans since the short-lived Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798, And if you want to learn about the Alien Sedition Acts of 1798, you need to listen to Judge Napolitano when he talks about that in one of his uh, number of speeches. It's it's a fantastic story. A very tragic story, too. That was during the the time of John Adams. Yet the Supreme Court upheld convictions under the unconstitutional World War I-era laws. Lowen says that the Wilson's administration cracked down on civil liberties during and after World War I. Quote, neither before nor since these campaigns has the United States come closer to being a police state. Wilson tried to erase dissent against his war policy by using the U.S. Post Office and the Justice Department to suppress free speech. He ordered the War Department to censor all telegraph and telephone traffic. He arrested convicted and imprisoned thousands of socialists under the Espionage Act, and refused to pardon socialist leader Eugene Debs by opposing the war, for opposing the war. Um, And Debs was uh, later um, pardoned by Warren Harding. And it goes on and on. So it's it's a a a lot of real tragedy that Woodrow Wilson brings to the plate and to American history. Now, defenders of Woodrow Wilson do point at different things. Um, How he tried to reduce um, tariffs, which, yes, that's a good thing. And they also always point to the 19th Amendment, right? And they'll say that the 19th Amendment, of course, is this, you know, women's suffrage, uh, giving women the right to vote. And it was passed in 1920, 100 years ago. But Woodrow Wilson had arrested women for suffragists and thrown them in jail where they went on hunger strikes and were force fed by their captors. He only eventually, reluctantly, supported suffrage because he was worried about his image. And 
just weeks prior to Wilson becoming president in his first term, um, the federal income tax was approved. Well, during his term, Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act in December of 1913. And this culminated in, you know, three years of discussion and debate over the development of a central bank, a central bank that uh, founders like Thomas Jefferson fought against and, and uh, had, had no desire for, and they knew the dangers of a central bank. Now, the Federal Reserve pinches the working class with the following. It's got perpetual inflation, cheap credit. It excessively expands the money supply. It devalues the nation's currency. It's responsible for routine bailouts. It's unable to generate long-lasting economic recovery, and it encourages deficit spending. And we see each one of those things going on year after year since 1913. Uh, perhaps, again, he, you know, he was a horrible racist, but his foreign intervention and all the damage that that caused, the unintended consequences of it, uh, the Federal Reserve, the destruction of civil liberties, all Woodrow Wilson and part of the progressive, the beginning of the progressive movement. And just wanted to share with you uh, the excerpts that I was reading out of the book was a book called Recarving Rushmore, Ranking the Presidents on Peace, Prosperity, and Liberty by Dr. Ivan Elin at the Independent Institute. It's a really good book. It's about a decade old or so, um, but I encourage you to check it out. I'll link to it below if you want to take a look at it. Um, it's not your typical list of best to worst presidents. It's a little bit different. And I, th I think you'll find it interesting and encouraging. And uh, anyway, just wanted to talk about Woodrow Wilson a little bit since he's made the news recently. And um, I appreciate you watching and I'll see you next time on the show.